Hello, fellow Pathfinders and Loris. This series of videos is to go over the story of Paizo's adventure path, the rise of the Rune Lords. It will be divided into six parts, one for each book in the path. And this will, for the most part, follow a straightforward look into the story. It will not cover the number of or stats of monsters, nor will it reveal every secret the path has to offer. With all that being said, spoilers ahead, and enjoy. Thousands of years ago, in the waning years of the Age of Legend, the Rune Lords ruled over what was once called Thassalon. However, in the early years of the Age of Darkness, Earthfall destroyed the once great nation. But most of the Rune Lords, masters of their personal runic magics, foresaw the danger and placed themselves on their own demiplanes, where they slept until their magics reawoke them to renew their empires. And so, for ten thousand years, the Rune Lords slept, and the world changed. In the year 4702, the stone giant Mokmurian accidentally reawakened the Rune Lord of Greed. Karzog. Wasting no time in his plan to bring his rule back to power, Karzog activated his rune well, a device which could extract the magical essence of those who, in life, exemplified a certain sin, in his case, greed. These souls would be necessary to bring him fully back to life, and so he commanded the giant, now his personal puppet, to go back and make the world ready for his harvest. Though other than whispers of giants gaining power elsewhere in the region, Karzog's personal activities have not had much effect. Unanticipated, however, was the activation of several minor rune wells. Most had little effects, being sunken under water or in the dungeons of Old Thassalon. But in the sleepy town of Sandpoint, this was not the case. Built atop the Catacombs of Wrath, dedicated to the Rune Lord Alonzist, was buried a minor rune well keyed to wrath and anger. Upon its activation, a shock wave of magical energy shot up through the town. Most woke in terrible rage from nightmares, but what had been there subsided. In a few cases, however, wrath found fertile soil. A bitter noble, having been cuckolded by his wife years earlier, called her to the porch, where he threw her to the jagged rocks in the sea below their cliffside manor. An artist, channeling pent-up rage from years of paternal abuse into hauntingly beautiful bird wood carvings, set about a plan to murder nearly two dozen townsfolk that he believed wronged him. And a young woman, left abandoned and pregnant by a local cur, and shamed by her past or father, succumbed to her anger, abandoning her goddess, and burning her church to the ground, her father with it. These events, dubbed the Late Unpleasantness, all came within months of each other. Bonjiku Kaijitsu, the noble, had gotten away with his fit of anger and rage, the act unnoticed. Jervis Stute, the mass murderer known as the Chopper, was burned by pyre on the beach after a string of 25 successful killings. And Nualia Tubin, the beautiful Asma daughter of the church, was presumed dead in the heinous fire that took the town's church and her father. However, Nualia yet lives. Her wrath has yet to be sated even after five years. She plans to become a monster herself and devotes herself to the goddess of monsters. In her quest, she wishes to burn not just the new cathedral of the town, but feels that all of Sandpoint itself should burn. But how was she to know that such burnt offerings would lead to the rise of the Rune Lords?
Our story begins on the 23rd of Rova, 4707 AR, in the small town of Sandpoint. Today marks the annual Swallowtail Festival, and our heroes are here for the festivities. For Sandpoint, it is extra special, as this day marks the consecration and opening of the new Sandpoint Cathedral. The people and guests are welcomed in the morning, with speeches by the mayor, sheriff, and priest. The day sees many different goings-on in terms of fun and games, interrupted only by lunch and the ceremonial swallowtail release, which sees the release of a full wagon of butterflies. The day finally begins to come to a close at sundown, where the priest of Desna, Father Xantis, takes the central podium in front of the cathedral. As he prepares to recite the prayer of first dreaming, however, everything changes with a horrible, shrieking song. A sharp retort, like the crack of distant thunder, slices through the excited crowds as the sun's setting rays paint the western sky. A stray dog that has crawled under a nearby wagon to sleep starts awake, and the buzz of two dozen conversations quickly hushes as all heads turn toward the central podium, where a beaming Father Xantis has taken the stage. He clears his throat, takes a breath to speak, and suddenly a woman's scream slices through the air. A few moments later, another scream rises, then another. Beyond them, a sudden surge of a strange new voices rises, high-pitched, tittering shrieks that sound not quite human. The crowd parts, and something low to the ground races by, giggling with disturbing glee as the stray dog gives a pained yelp and then collapses with a gurgle, its throat cut open from ear to ear. As blood pools around its head, the raucous sound of a strange song begins, chanted from shrill, scratchy voices. <laughs> town guard preoccupied, it falls to the heroes to take action themselves. Two waves of goblins make it past the guards and near the church before they are finally defeated by the heroes. Upon a quick rest, they hear a scream and frantic barking coming from the north. Pushing to the north gate, the heroes see a goblin commando riding its goblin dog steed in the final moments of a battle between it and a scared noble's dog. Arriving at the scene, sees the dog gutted by the goblin's horse chopper and its corpse thrown aside into some barrels as the rest of the goblins cheer. As they turn to kill the man that set the horde creature against them, it allows the heroes to get the drop on the distracted goblins. After a hard-fought series of battles, the goblins are dealt with and driven from the town. Having been saved, the noble introduces himself to the group as Aldrin Foxglove. He thanks the heroes, paying special attention to particularly beautiful women of human or elven heritage, or on someone he sees as the strongest of the group. Regardless, he tells them to find him later at the Rusty Dragon Inn, where he'd like to talk and maybe more properly reward them. By this time, the goblin menace has been driven from the town, either through the gate or they themselves jumping to their unknowing death. The ones captured alive, either by the guard or by the party, have no real information to give, save the vagueness of their leader being one of you longshanks, and that their goal was to kill and burn everything. The party is thanked by many of the remaining citizens that are still in the town that saw their bravery, and the innkeeper of the Rusty Dragon, Ameiko Kaijitsu, 
offers them free rooms as a way to personally thank them for their help. Today marks the beginning of the party, becoming local heroes. It's not easy being local heroes in a small town. Everyone wants a piece of you. Usually it's pretty good. Rewards like free rooms at the inn or discounts at the local general store. Sometimes even a little nightly action. Most times it's just gold and a bit of status. With Aldrin Foxglove, he invites the heroes with him out on a hunt, wanting to learn more about his saviors before he leaves, paying his special attention to at least one of those members of the group. Either way, the heroes are known throughout the town now, and as heroes, it comes with a bit more responsibility than the average citizen. It comes as some surprise, but the attack on the town of Sandpoint was only a very loud diversion. Father Xantus notes that there's been a disturbance in the graveyard. The tomb of the previous priest, Ezekain Tobin, has been breached, and the vault hangs ajar. He and the sheriff seek out the party, asking for help in the matter to see if anything's wrong. Upon entering the crypt, a few skeletons attack the party, but are easily dealt with. These were placed here to take care of a pesky priest or overwhelm a guard, not face the might of the town's new saviors. Upon destroying the undead, a quick look makes it clear that Father Tobin's body has been stolen. For what ends, none at this point could quite understand. Near the end of the week has another point of note, an argument between the Rusty Dragon's owner, Emeko, and a noble who turns out to be her father, Lanjiku Kaijitsu. In the tavern, he stands as a man that looks far older than he should, racked with paranoia and shame. As well he should. For unbeknownst to all, it was he, who under penalty of blackmail, had allowed the goblins to enter and ransack the town during the festival. Seeing the party, he accuses them of endangering the townsfolk, saying they should have just left things to the town guard. Just what we need. A filthy band of vagrants to attract even more trouble. The father finally gives his daughter an ultimatum. To stop embarrassing her family and come with him when he leaves for the capital of Maganmar. Or be cut out of his will. After an ill-attempted grab at her, the more adventurous Ameko dodges before braining him with a soupy ladle. His pride wounded, the noble takes his leave. You're as dead to me as your mother. I'll need a well-cleaned ladle now, since jackass stew is not on the menu. After about a week or so, Sheriff Hemlock calls a meeting with the heroes, Mayor Deverin, and an elven woman by the name of Shelu Endosana. Shelu is an unofficial part of the guard who mostly goes to scout the hinterlands of Verusia, and has been a thorn in the side of the local goblin tribes for years now. Unfortunately, she also now brings terrible news. Goblin raids have increased lately, particularly between Nettlewood and Mosswood on the Lost Coast. While she's done what she can, the goblin problem is not going away. Belos told me of your work against the goblins. Well done. I've dedicated the last several years of my life to keeping them from causing too much trouble around these parts, but they're tenacious and feckered little runts, like weeds that bite. There are five major goblin tribes in the region, and traditionally they're pretty good at keeping each other in line with intertribal squabbles and the like. Yet, from what I've been able to piece together, members of all five tribes were involved in the raid on Sandpoint. A fair number of the Mosswood goblins I dealt with yesterday are pretty beat up, and there were a lot of chatter about the Longshanks who killed so many of them. Now that I've met you, it seems obvious from their descriptions who they were talking about. It seems you've made an impression. In any event, the fact that the five goblin tribes are working together disturbs me. Goblin tribes don't get along unless they've got something big planned, and big plans require big bosses. I'm afraid someone's moved in on the goblins and organized them. And judging by these recent raids, what they're organizing seems like bad news for us all. 
Hemlock, at this point, requests the heroes to stay in town and watch over it. He plans to take a small contingent to the capital and retrieve more guards until the goblin threat has been dealt with, and can't trust the town's safety to just the skeleton crew he'll be leaving. Like the guards' public presence, he asks them to do so as well, to keep the town's mind at ease for the next few days while he'll be gone. Of course, the easy presence of temporary hero guard isn't meant to go smoothly. The morning after Hemlock and Shelu leave, the heroes are approached by a familiar figure to them. An elderly halfling woman, Bathana Corwin, a maid at the Rusty Dragon Inn. Privately, she informs them that Ameko has gone missing, and she found a crumpled note in her employer's room. A note from her older brother, Suto. Hello, sis. I hope this letter finds you well, and with some free time on your hands. Because we've got something of a problem. It's to do with Father. Seems that he might have had something to do with Sandpoint's recent troubles with the goblins. And I didn't want to bring this matter to the authorities because we both know that he'd just weasel his way out of it. You've got some pull here in town, though. If you can meet me at the glassworks at midnight tonight, maybe we can figure out how to make sure he faces the punishment he deserves. Knock twice, and then three times more. And then once more at the delivery entrance, and I'll let you in. In any case, I don't have to impress upon you the delicate matter of this request. If news got out, you know these local roofs would assume that you and I were in on the whole thing too, don't you? They've got no honor at all in these parts. I still don't understand how you could stand to stay here. Anyway, don't tell anyone about this. There are other complications as well. Ones I'd rather talk to you in person about tonight. Don't be late. Suto. The elderly woman worries that the boy is troubled. A half-elf boy to parents that are both human, sent away by an enraged father, never to have contact with any family? This was the result of the infidelity that would later lead to the murderous rage of Lanjiku. When confronting his father about it at the mother's funeral, he received a cracked jaw by his father's cane for his trouble, before cursing his father and leaving. Ameko had always tried to connect with her older brother, even after he had struck her after an argument. Bethana worries that while she may have good intentions, Suto may not. And since Hemlock is gone, the party is her only hope. The old woman is right to worry. After all, it was Suto that led the goblins that fateful day. curious sight when the heroes come to the glassworks. The large building is curiously silent, its curtains drawn, and there's been a noticeable lack of traffic in and out recently. But the pluming smoke reassures the neighborhood that it must just be Longiku and his men working on some big new project. If only that were the case. Entry of the glassworks reveals a mess the further the heroes go. A kitchen and pantry wrecked by small grubby hands trying to get food. A servant quarter dyed red with blood, but no bodies, and the unmistakable sound of shrill cackling and glass breaking in the glass working room. The party finds a macabre display upon entering this area, the servants' bodies dismembered, the smell of cooked flesh hitting their noses, and many of the servants' bodies covered in hardening glass, much like the full body of Lanjiku whose body is propped up in the center alcove, entirely covered in runny sheets of hardened glass. This fight with the goblins is tough. They're masters of improvised combat, and use whatever they can against the outnumbered party. From broken and thrown shards of glass, to hot tongs dripping with molten glass, and even attempted trips into the furnaces, the goblins use every trick they can to fight. Upon most being slain, one goblin recognizes them, and the few remaining flee to their current leader in the underground storage. Giving chase reveals Suto Kaijitsu, who fights alongside the goblins as the biggest threat the party has dealt with thus far. The wrathful man clearly is more than a match for them one-on-one, -on -one, but together, the heroes overpower him. If captured alive, Suto's not much of a talker, but it doesn't have to be. The notes in his room depict much of what he now knows, 
and what's implied is even worse. The first set of notes depicts the raid that the heroes repelled of thirty goblins, while he and a few more stole the body of Father Tobin. A few more maps show a force of two hundred goblins. The situation, it seems, is dire indeed. They also mention something below the glassworks, a quasit, and a creature in Thistletop named Malfeshnikor. The implication that something is happening below the town is quite disturbing and mysterious. Finally, there are pages depicting erotic drawings of a woman, recognizable as Nawalia, Father Tobin's daughter. Distressingly, the final picture depicts her as a monster, with bat-like wings, a pointed tail, and forked tongue. Unknown to the party, Nualia is well on her way to becoming the monster she desires. In the next room over, thankfully, is a Mako, bound at the wrists and ankles, while blindfolded and gagged. She's been beaten fairly hard, black-eyed and bruised. She's in no condition to do much of anything other than just answer questions. The distraught woman reveals what Suto had told her, that Nualia is leading several mercenaries and goblins with big plans for Sandpoint. Plans that he didn't want her in the town to suffer. He had offered her a chance to join his company at Thistletop, to be on the opposite side of the destruction. Ameko, of course, slapped him, shocked he'd sunk so low. It wasn't long after that that the goblins overwhelmed her before she had a chance to arm herself. She then stoically takes the news that her father, too, is dead. And while she doesn't like it, it leaves her as the sole heir to the Kaijutsu family and Sandpoint's newest noble. Of course, the glassworks are only one part of the problem. As noted in his journal, Suto mentioned a closet lurking somewhere beneath the town, along with her freaks. Whatever they are can't be good for Sandpoint, so at some point, it's down to the tunnel to what they don't know is the Catacombs of Wrath, and the current lair of the closet, Irelium. A red marble statue of a strikingly beautiful, but at the same time, monstrously enraged human woman stands in the middle of this room, her stony expression twisted in fury. The woman wears the flowing robes, and her long hair is held back from her face by an intricate headdress of hooks and blades. In her left hand, she carries a large book, the face of which is inscribed with a seven-pointed star. In her right hand, she holds a glittering metal and ivory ransour. The old ruins once inside bear the unmistakable architecture of Thassalon. It is, however, ruined by the multitudes of aberrations that guard the rooms and halls. Mostly that of Sinspawn, grotesque and tortured mockeries of humans. It makes sense, as the rune wells are the items used to create Sinspawn by Runelord Alonsist. It doesn't take too much to find Aurelium, for she stands in the largest room, the Cathedral of Wrath. This huge room looks like nothing more than an immense underground cathedral. Stone doors stand on either side of the main entrance, but beyond this, the walls are carved with strange, spiky runes. In the center of the room is a large pool with a ring of polished human skulls, balanced on stone spikes, arranged in a circle around the deeper midsection. At the far end of the room, a pair of stone stairways leads up to the pulpit, on which sits a second pool, this one triangular, and filled with churning, bubbling water that looks almost like translucent lava. Yet, while wisps of what look like heat and steam rise from the strange orange liquid, the room itself is deathly cold. She shrieks at the heroes before cutting her wrist over the magic well, itself shining brightly before producing a new sin spawn. Though the pool no longer has enough fuel for more, and the closet knows it before heading into battle, Aurelian provides a challenge against something that resists much of what they could normally do. With the right planning and persistence, the heroes are able to finally slay the closet. Delving much further into the old ruin reveals a mutated goblin, Korolas, the result of drinking tainted waters at the shrine of Lamastu. Near him are some old stairs, blocked by the ancient cataclysm that saw the end of Thessalon. Though, if one listens closely, 
the sounds of something much more wicked could have been heard. Perhaps if they had paid a bit more attention, they'd have even seen the writing on the walls. Upon the return of Sheriff Hemlock, the heroes immediately head out for Thistletop. It's not long of a journey, however, it is a difficult place to actually reach. Following the Lost Coast Road is easy enough to see Thistletop past the growing bramble of the Nettlewood, where the majority of difficulty lay before the dungeon. It's here, in the Nettlewood, that the goblins have set up most of their outside forces and animals, tended to by the druid Grogmert and his companion, Tangletooth. To the north leads to the island and the Thistletop ruins, where the bulk of the current goblin forces lay. The goblins of Thistletop's top floor are led by War Chief Ripnugget, who sits in the ruined throne room as though a king. The chief is unlike most of his followers, and smart for a goblin, initially asking for parley with the heroes that trespass on his land and castle. This is, of course, a ploy to separate who he believes to be the weakest from the heavily armed help before springing his trap. Riding atop of his giant gecko steed, Stickfoot, Rip Nugget regardless calls for his commandos and war chanter to attack. While he and Stickfoot have a mobility advantage, Rip Nugget is still only a goblin, and he and his entourage are swiftly defeated. The area below is wrought with much more dangerous beings, if many less. Here is where Nuwalia's generals rest. Upon the party's descent down the stairs, they hear chatter and a booming voice coming from a foul-smelling room to the southwest corner. Inside is a harem of goblin women, in various states of dress, courting a large bugbear, the trapper Brosmus. Angered by his personal time being interrupted, he charges near blindly into the room, swinging his flail, hoping to kill any elf that he sees. In such a state, He's luckily easily dealt with, as long as he is unable to retreat. <laughs> Though the goblin women can provide to be a nuisance themselves in allowing him to. To the south lie the bedchambers of all those who live here as important members of Nualia's group. But only one is currently present. A warrior by the name of Oric Vancaster. Oric leads the party in a very straightforward fight, his back to a wall as he tries to fend off one hero at a time. But eventually, the numbers game catches up to him, and he surrenders, pleading for his life. On top of his own treasures, he even offers to help and lead the party through the areas he knows of, and tells them of a few places to be wary of. A small caved section to the northeast that's home to some wriggly monster, and that the Temple of Lamasu is currently guarded by a pair of monstrous dogs. Stone fonts containing frothy dark water sit to the north and south of the eastern entrance of this room, and twin banks of stone pillars run the length of the long chamber. At the western end, shallow stairs rise to a platform about two feet off the ground. The walls surrounding this platform are lit by hanging braziers that emit glowing red smoke, giving the place an unnerving crimson lighting that throws the base-relieved carvings of countless monsters feasting on fleeing humans into lurid display. A black marble altar stone, its surface heaped with ashes and bone fragments, squats before a ten-foot-tall statue. The sculpture depicts a very pregnant, but otherwise shapely naked woman, who wields a kukri in each hand, and has a long reptilian tail, bird-like talent feet, and the snarling head of a three-eyed jackal with a forked tongue. The left kukri flickers with a fiery orange light, while the right one glows with a cold blue radiance. The dogs in question are yeth hounds, terrible evil outsiders that attack anyone they do not recognize, their howls putting the rest of the complex on alert. The fight against the flying hounds is difficult, but not insurmountable. A check of the altar reveals smears of ashes and bits of bone, the last remnants of Father Tobin, as a dark offering to the Mother of Monsters. Further still, the heroes reach the research room, one of the most heavily trafficked areas, 
and a place Nualia and her cohort, Lyria Akanja, have taken much of their time in. Though nowadays, Nualia has left this room alone, content in searching for a way to free her new ally below. Lyrie, however, spends most of her time here in the peace and quiet, which is now to be interrupted. A powerful wizard, but a coward at heart, Lyria would rather run than fight once hit. But learning the fate of Suto sends her into a rage, and thus she fights to her death. But her array of offensive spells does not make things easy for the heroes. This room too holds the stairs to the final floor, and Nualia's presumed location. And indeed, this is where she stays. Her body is mostly normal, save for two major things. On her stomach, she carries the scarred sign of Lamastu, symbolizing her ability to bear the monsters in her name. And for her service, her left arm has begun to turn monstrous as well, a bright red veiny thing clashing against her natural olive skin. She wears an impassive mask, save for the rage in her eyes, and she does her best to attack and destroy these interlopers, who dare to challenge her rightful destiny and revenge. With time to prepare, she's quite the force. But though she tries her hardest to kill them, even escape when things take a turn for the worst, Nualia is finally slain, so close to her goals, and yet cut down like any other monster would be. Nualia's notes tell her story, that of a woman scorned, having found new twisted faith, and set upon a quest for revenge. They speak of Malfeshnikor, how the creature, a Bargeist, was trapped since the time of Thassalon, and how he'd be the key to her revenge. A search of the lower levels reveals nothing. No Bargeist, no Thassalonian ruins save a small crypt. And so the heroes set out again, back to Sandpoint to tell the good news. Maybe it's a good thing they couldn't find the door. Who knows if the beast was too challenging. But what wonders? What would they have found? In the general scheme, the events of the last two weeks or so in the heroes' lives, it's nothing more than happenstance. Nothing to truly link what would inevitably come. Save the happenstance to give the heroes a place to call home and want to defend it for a time. Of course, heroes are relatively reactive. It isn't until a much bigger problem arises that they become proactive. With Noalia gone and the goblins thrown back into intertribal squabbles, the party can relax for a while yet. How long that is? Well... Leave that Sheriff Hemlock again, isn't it? This is, again, a generalization of events. With so many tables out there, there are a multitude of different ways that these adventures can pan out. So how did it happen at your table? Have you run this before? Do you plan to? Did you die? Be honest with me now. Nawali rolled a crit and cut you in half, didn't she? Regardless, tell me in the comments below. And remember, to always walk your own path. Mm -hmm.